Neil, the concepts of complexity and emergence have become critical in understanding how the world is constructed. Many physicists um, and mathematicians have been dealing with these subjects in their very widespread approach. From your experience as a biologist, as a liver pathologist, uh, do you see these elements also as part of uh, as part of the, the the environment that you work with? You know, in in biology, I think very early on, complexity applications to how immune systems work was a very robust thing. When I started getting interested in complexity theory as it relates to stem cell behaviors and then ultimately all cell behaviors, how cells self-organize to create tissues and organs and bodies. It wasn't really that widespread. The biologists, I think, were actually kind of resistant or um, didn't see it as applicable. Um, whereas, like you said, uh, in, in uh, discussing social systems like urban development or economic systems, that was huge. Um, Physicists and chemists were talking about self-organizing things. Nanotechnology was very much about self-organization, but in biology, not so much. Now it has become more common. It's been over, you know, since uh, the early uh, the early days of the 21st century, it started to increase, and now there's more discussion of that. I encountered complexity theory myself through trying to figure out how stem cells might be moving between organs. Mm. And I was in dialogue with an artist who actually was very familiar with complexity theory from uh, virtual uh, creatures that self-organized in, in a world she had designed. And so she taught me about this. And I started thinking about cells moving between organ systems. We had shown bone marrow turning into cells of virtually every other organ in the body. That meant cells were moving around, not just immune cells and blood cells, but Liver cells were traveling. You know, could cells leave the liver and go to the heart? Could it, you know, we still don't know a lot of the details, but there's much more rich trafficking around the body of, of things. How does complexity theory figure into that? Well, um, with complex systems, you get self-organization if you have enough individuals that are interacting with certain, uh, fulfilling certain criteria. Um, we certainly have enough cells in the body. You know. Estimates vary, but let's say we have uh, one number I hear is there are four trillion human cells in the body. Um, that's kind of interesting because there are probably 400 trillion bacteria. And without those bacteria, we can't survive. Um, in fact, you aren't a human body without those bacteria. So, for example, if you um, have no bacteria in your digestive tract, so boy in the bubble, or a mouse raised in a laboratory where it doesn't colonize with bacteria, the, the villous surface, the, the little hair-like fingers at the tops of the cells that line the GI tract, that's where all the absorption of your food takes place. Um, if you don't have bacteria, you don't have those. Mm. You put bacteria in, and then those little finger-like projections develop. So your genome doesn't code for the structure of the lining of your GI tract. Mm. Your genome codes for the interaction with the bacteria mm. out of which self-organizes an operational digestive tract. Mm. So without that, you can't absorb food and you're gonna die. Um, we have specific bacteria we now know, though everyone is a little bit different, but the bacteria that line the creases of your joints, um, without them, you'd probably die as well because what they do is they digest the cell membranes of the dying skin cells at the top and create lanolin, which lubricates your joints. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that, within a few days after birth, your fingers would start to crack, you'd be open to infection, and you'd probably die from sepsis. Mm -hmm. So that says a couple of interesting things. Number one, cells at the cellular level, it's not our, you know, you cut your finger, you don't have to tell your finger to heal. It self-organizes. That's what you're watching when that happens. Um, at the same time, that also tells you that your human body, which is only 1% at the cell level, is a colony of cells where 99% are not human. What makes you human includes the 99% cells that are bacteria, and maybe some fungi, maybe some viruses. So what does it mean to be a human body? Um, 
you have to start to unpack that kind of question. When you look at the body not as this thing, which we then have broken down to study it in our reductionist approaches, which are very successful as far as they go, into the cells which we think of as the building blocks. Um, but that's a very concrete sort of thing. And we actually, using that kind of approach, we think of it as though we are breaking the body apart. It's a machine broken down into its pieces. The reductionist. Yeah. But we're not machines. The cells are alive as much as our bodies are alive. So the cells are dynamically interacting with each other. And the minute you ask that, you have to ask, well then, is a cell the fundamental smallest unit? That's cell doctrine. That's what makes Western biology and Western medicine what it is. When they had a microscope and they could look under the microscope, um, there had been a debate. Is the body made of indivisible subunits? The Greeks called them atoms. So it used to be that the terminology um, went uh, from physics to biology, though now we're tending to go in the other direction. So they called them atoms, and when they looked under, or is the body an endlessly divisible fluid continuum that you can keep dividing smaller and smaller? They invented the microscope, saw cell membranes and cell walls, which looked like an empty box. And you can't subdivide an empty box into smaller boxes. That's as far as you can go. They said, oh, argument settled. The smallest subunit of the body is the cell. Bodies are made of cells. That's Western medicine. That's Western biology. 20 years later, they learned to stain the tissues and see things like the nuclei inside the cell. It took 20 years to put the furniture in the cell. It was called a cell because it was like the cell of a monk or a prisoner. There was no furniture inside. Yeah. Then they filled in the furniture. What if the technology had been a little different? What if the first thing they saw were the nuclei? They would have said, wow, look, there's an endlessly divisible, in, uh, endlessly divisible fluid continuum. There are these little balls hanging in it. We'll figure out what those are, but wow. And we'd have a fluid model of the body. And 20 years later, when they saw cell membranes, because they figured out how to stain for them, they wouldn't have said, oh, we were wrong. They would have said, oh, look, there's semi-permeable partitioning of the fluid space. <laughs> but Western medicine and Western biology would be fluid doctrine, not cell doctrine. So at the level, at the nanoscopic level, at the molecular level, at the atomic level, cells don't have any, there's no there there either. It's, they're not a thing any more than a flock of birds is a thing or a school of fish is a thing. It may look like that from a distance. You look like you're this machine-like thing. You know, our arms move, it's levers and pulleys. We know at the microscopic level, you're not a thing at all. You're a community of single cells that are self-organizing to create you, only 1% of which are you, as you think of yourself. But the emergent property of all of it turns out to be me. Yes, but it's the emergent property of all those levels of scale. Mm -hmm. So it's the molecules and atoms floating in the water that makes up the majority of your body. And, you know, traditionally, what we're taught in medical school, I think they're still teaching it this way, <laughs> though it will soon change, is that, um, so let's say you take the, the molecules that make your muscles move. There are two proteins called actin and myosin. And actin is a straight little filament, and myosin has an elbow bend. And then you put an energy molecule in there, and it binds there, and when that releases its energy, the elbow bends, and the proteins slide past each other, and we have, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of these in each muscle cell, and that's why muscle cells contract. That's why my hands are drawing together and your eyes are blinking. Um, so people thought ATP supplies that energy. A fellow named Toshio Yanagida in Tokyo did an experiment where he took a single actin filament and anchored it with laser tweezers under a fluorescent microscope, put a myosin filament that had a fluorescent label on it so you could watch it under fluorescent light, and put it in. And what you would expect is that it would attach and stay still, and then you'd put in the energy molecule ATP and it would start to move. That's not what they saw. What happened was they attached the myosin filament and started bouncing around because of Brownian motion. This is what Einstein described in one of his earliest papers, that the, the molecules, you can put chalk dust in water and you watch the yeah. chalk dust move around. It's because the water molecules are bombarding the molecule. That happens with chalk dust. It's certainly going to happen with a single protein. When you add the energy molecule, um, the energy it supplies quenches the randomness into a small zone. Mm. That's the quench disorder, the limited randomness you need in a complex system to self-organize. And then you start to get directional movement. Mm. So 
you can take the body down to the molecular level. So does that mean the molecules in the atoms are the definitive smallest thing? Well, we know they're not. Mo molecules are nothing but self-organizing atoms. You don't sit down. There's no one telling the atom, you know, I'm going to take one of you here and one of you here, and I'm going to build up an actin filament and put it together, and then I've built a car, and it's going to work if you put the key in it. It doesn't work like that. There's a bunch of atoms going around, and they start to bind together. And under the right circumstances, like inside a human body with DNA that codes for actin, you will get an actin filament. So what you have is a hierarchy that complexity theory and emergence is occurring at all of these different levels in a continuum. Yes. Yes. As opposed to saying, ah, here's the secret. Right. And what the secret is the whole continuum. Exactly. And whole, W-H-O-L-E, is maybe the key most essential piece because we think of it as a hierarchy. I will use the same word. I'll say we have a hierarchy of complex systems. But the problem with the word hierarchy it is, is that it implies that there's this thing, one thing over another over another. But the fact is, at this moment, you are a machine. At this level of scale, we can understand the movement of my arm as a machine. It explains everything. Simultaneously, your body is a community of single cells organizing. Simultaneously, you are a bag of water in which biomolecules are afloat and interacting with each other. Simultaneously, um, you are atoms self-organizing into the water molecules and into the biomolecules of your body. I think when you look at... Um, other culture, other cultural models of biology, uh, particularly from Asia, they often talk about a coarse body, a subtle body, an energy body. And it's often diagrammed as like boxes and boxes and boxes. And you look at that and go, we know anatomically we're not Russian dolls. You don't open me up and find, oh, there's the subtle body in there. I think what they're saying is that you can treat the body, interact with the body, understand the body at each of these levels of scale. So if I'm, I've broken my arm, I go to an orthopedist and he puts it in a cast, that's dealing with my body as the coarse body. If I have an infection and I need an antibiotic or I'm depressed and I have an antidepressant, then we're dealing with the body at the molecular level, so maybe that's the subtle body. Um, we know that if you have a broken bone and you put electrical current over it, it will heal more quickly and more fully. So there we're dealing with electromagnetic energy. We're dealing with the body at the quantum level. Is that the energy body? It's not nested dolls. That's just the best metaphor they could come up with. But our body is not in hierarchy. It is all of those things all the time. How we choose to view it in any moment. Um, how we make therapeutic interventions determines which of those bodies we're dealing with. But we're always making a choice.